Tell the Hello, folks. This is David Russell, Global Head of Market Strategy at TradeStation. Great to be with everyone today. And now we are starting this webinar. We're starting a minute or two early. We're doing this live on YouTube for the first time. So I'm just checking a few things to make sure everything is working correctly. And I'm going to mute this over here. All right. Looks like everything is working. We're using this software for the first time. So wanted to make sure it's working and um, great to be with you guys. Let me start off with some disclosures. Let me first share some links. There is a link on the trade station. There's a, a blog post on the trade station website. Let me just check something. It should appear in the comment section. Like I said, this is the first time we're going to be using this. Good. So I shared some comments that should appear via YouTube and Twitter. Those go to some different things, including some of our disclosure pages um, and to the TradeStation website where we do um, a blog post. For each webinar, we do a blog post. So if you go to TradeStation.com, let me just quickly show you where that is. So if you're on tradestation.com and then you go to insights, wait a second, sorry. It'll bring you to this blog post. It'll bring you to this blog, the Market Insights blog, and then you click on this. This is the actual rundown that we're going to be using today. So let me just quickly go through my disclosures now. It's great to be with everyone. Again, I am David Russell, Global Head of Market Strategy at TradeStation. Here's just some disclosures about the, um, the things we're going to be talking about. So interesting market. Um, you know, last week we talked about the development of resistance at the gap following the Fed, the kind of steepening downtrend, and that has kind of played out. We ended up last week with a bearish outside week on the S and P 500, and we're going to be getting to those things. So now, if you guys go to this blog post, if you are new to us here for for market trends, you can um, go to um, the TradeStation website and find this. Um, this blog post. And in here, we have um, some workspaces that we can share with you if you're a TradeStation customer, and you can then load them on your TradeStation platform. So some of the big things we were really looking at here, if I look here at the chart of the S&P 500, was the, um, you know, really this gap we had talked about after the Fed, it made this, this bearish gap that became resistance. We have been watching for support around this level, around 42.35. I'm sorry, 43.25, that was the high from last August. We noticed how we slipped back, slipped back under it. And then the price action turned into a large kind of bearish um, outside week that really kind of dragged on, on things and gave us some follow through today. So the S&P has been down for almost, it's only had one green candle in the last several sort of, um, you know, probably the last week and a half. So this has been kind of, you know, as the um, intermediate trend gets more bearish, um, this is a sort of intensification of the move we're seeing um, counter trend moves. In this case, bounces get smaller and we get more uh, of a strong, smooth move in the in the direction of the trend. It was true in the upside here. And now it seems to be playing out the same way um, at this moment for, um, you know, for the S&P 500. So I think right now we take a look at the bigger thing. You know, we talked here last week. We talked about how multiples um, and earnings valuations um, you know, are at risk at a time of rising geopolitical risk. Now, we had talked about many different things. If you look at the, the webinar we actually did last week, and some of these things have kind of played out. We had talked about, if we look at our previous rundown, we had talked about things like, um, you know, the, the fact that a combination of higher for longer and geopolitical risk may pressure valuations. Another thing was we talked about Apple coming under some pressure with issues in China, with Huawei taking market share, and then um, something here about MacBook, the MacBook losing. But it's interesting also, if we look here, here is an article on, this is on Seeking Alpha, but it actually started on Reuters. There was an article that basically said Chinese retailers are giving big discounts for the iPhone 15. So we're seeing a continuation of this. And I think this is something right now that really is kind of the narrative of what is happening, is that the people are taking a look at the market and they're saying the valuations right now on some of these tech stocks don't make as much sense. And it's not just because of the Fed. It's because of things like what happens 
if Apple does start to lose market share in a place like China. When we see things like the Android gaining market share, maybe it's based on politics. Maybe it's just a normal market trend, you know, of, um, you know, market share gains. Maybe the new Huawei phone is better or something. The key thing is, is that if this becomes a trend, it simply means that people are not going to be willing to pay as much for a stock like Apple. And I think that's the real reason. Now, Apple reports, if you look here on the trade station platform, we have, um, you know, the, um, the next earnings date function here tells us earnings are after the bell on the second. A lot of you guys probably know that. But I think the thing here with Apple is to me, this is, you know, um, to me, something of a, of a risk of seeing things kind of continuing to weaken in China. What I'm really seeing here when I look at this earnings season, we look at a response to something like Google or Alphabet or Meta. My sense is actually that something kind of insidious and is, is happening here which is that people are taking advantage of earnings season to sell. And I think that's actually something that we have to kind of um, focus on here. And my, my sense here is that what we're really seeing is people are looking out and they're saying these stocks don't demand the valuations they should have because if we have Chinese issues dragging on things like the semiconductors, because we have these this back and forth with, um, with China and the Biden administration, that knocks down some of the valuation of, of, the, of the tech sector. You look at it with Apple as well. So people are looking out and they're actually saying, do we want the valuations to be where they are? Are these businesses as, as impervious to risk as people kind of thought they were? So I think that's one big issue here. But then the other thing is with rising interest rates and then some of the, there, there's an, well, that's the other you know obvious thing that's out there, but something else did come from the meta results, the Google results and the snap results. And what we found was that they say that that advertising is going to be hurt by um, the unrest in the Middle East, and that, I guess it kind of makes sense when you think about it. When there's all these, you know, people showing pictures of war, or um, you know, people, what, you know, one side versus another. There's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of it's 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 a situation where it's easy to offend people on either side. Um, it's easy for um, you know for for people to get upset, and you know. All these political issues that surround a situation like we have now, unfortunately, in the Middle East, um, it's not good for online advertising. Um, you know, the people are not going to want to advertise, especially on the social media platforms. And that now is another wrinkle because now suddenly what Meta did was you no know, one of the two. I can't remember which of the two. They widened their guidance on on revenue because they're like, we don't really know what's going to happen. So now there's another fear that's coming into the market. So I think it's important to realize here is that a lot of these people viewed them as kind of impervious, you know, bulletproof businesses. They're not economically cyclical. They're safe growth, all that sort of stuff. And now maybe that belief is not as strong as it was. And as that happens, multiples come down. And I think that's really the main thing we need to focus on here. It's not so much a question of even the quality earnings per se. It's a question of, you know, the long-term valuations that these companies have. We knew interest rates were rising, but now I think we're starting to consider as well the geopolitical questions of what that could mean for global companies like Apple, Meta, um, Google, all these kind of companies that have a global footprint. This is now something that I think is entering into the equation that was not there before. Okay. I, I want to just see if you guys have any questions, go ahead and tell me I, with this new software, I should be able to see, um, I should be able to see quite uh, quotes of people that are putting in. Again, I apologize for any technical issues. We're learning this for the first time. It's a new piece of software that allows us to go on Twitter and YouTube and do a webinar all at the same time. We had a little bit of an issue with our webinar on the trade station website, but we'll have it up and running soon. So I apologize if anyone had issues with that. Um, okay. So, Let's look at some of the other, other things we wanted to point out here in our rundown. So, like we said, all right, um, all right, let's look at this one. There was a bearish outside week, and now if we look at the S&P 500, we're under the 200-day moving average for the first time, um, you know, since March. The uh, the 100-day moving average is starting to fall. Now, I've said before, if we look at the, S at the S&P here, the 100-day moving average, in my opinion, this is actually – for direction of the longer term trend, I don't really think the 200 day is especially useful. We actually one time, I don't have time to get into it now, but we one time actually optimized and we said, which of the long term moving averages is most 
um, you know, has the most ability to kind of anticipate the directional turns in the market over the longer term. So we use trade stations back testing. I created a custom indicator that basically went long or short, hypothetically, of the S&P 500 based on the change of direction of a single um, moving average, a long moving average. And I actually found that 111 day moving average was the was the the one that had the most ability to anticipate longer term trends. If you look at the performance 12 months after the turn happened, I can go back and dig those things out. And nothing of this is a recommendation, but you know, if you're new to TradeStation, we have the ability on our platform to do things like that, to test and see which indicator, um, you know, which setting on an indicator is going to give the the uh, you know the most accurate sort of responses or the best reads on the market. And we actually found that with 111 day moving average, basically when it changes direction. It, it can actually tell you where the market is going for a period of months and, and you know quarters into the future. And so you know I had always looked at the 100 myself, not the 200, because often by the time you get to the 200, you're already in a pretty ugly situation. And so what, what's happening here is the, um, you know, the 100 day started to turn negative right here. So we had done this previous chart, and I'll just bring back this chart. I'm going to make this a bigger, I have it somewhere else. In fact, wait a second, I have it. MT blog. I, mean, I have so many workspaces, so many charts. I'm like someone who has too many kittens, right? I, except I have too many charts. I love them all and sometimes not sure which one to look at. So this is the 20, the 30, and the 50-day simple moving averages. And I've just noticed, you know, in and of itself, these are not going to give any immediate signals. But when you see them all kind of line up in a certain direction, like they did here, and like they do here, you know, you have a pretty clear establishment of an intermediate term trend. So from my perspective here, you know, this is going to be a real kind of weight on the market uh, on the S&P 500 for the foreseeable future. Um, we had talked about the, you know, the the sharpening of the downtrend that we saw here. There's a trend line here. If we look at the previous webinar, we had actually, you know, we had shown here, there's this trend line and then it got steeper. So the decline steepened. Um, and so I think we're seeing now that acceleration. And at this point in time, you know, in my perspective, you know, there's a few things that can happen. We can kind of stabilize here and chop and sit for a period of time. Or if things continue to worsen, you know, it could just be a continuation and, and, and a deeper, you know, push to the downside. I think right now we have to realize that there are a lot of positives in this, you know, in the market right now that I am going to get to. But this geopolitical thing. Um, just creates this overhang of uncertainty. And and the thing that, like I said, is most concerning to me is, is it looks like people are using earnings season as an opportunity to sell. Because very often we'll see with institutional investors is, is that they, something is true. And I think we've probably all had this as retail investors. You know something is going to happen or you have a sense of it. You put the position in, doesn't work, it crashes against you or something. Then earnings come out and then the stock rallies the way you think it's going to go. And so very often what I've noticed is that earnings reports are simply liquidity events when large money can come into the market or leave the market. When people are looking to do large amounts of stuff, they wait for that sort of volume get volume spike. You get around earnings. And what I think we're seeing right here is that that's what we saw with Tesla, Meta, um, Google, and some of these others. So... What's also interesting to me is the violence of the drops. Like if you look at Whirlpool, this was to me a stunning drop uh, because it kind of shows, I think, people a little more of a of a hair trigger here to the downside. So um, from my perspective, this is, looks like a market where people are, um, it, it's more in a kind of distribution uh, bearishness here. And, you know, I think we have to be careful of trusting it too soon because, um, you know, at this point in time, the situation in the Middle East, we don't know when it's going to end. We don't know exactly what the end of it even looks like. Then again, if you look here at our rundown, what do we have? We have basically the Fed, we say, or the calendar. We always try and look, when we do the market trends, we look at basically the trends in the actual S&P 500, things like higher highs, higher lows, we look at different indicators overbought, oversold. We look at key levels. We look at things like Fibonacci retracements and stuff like that. We also look at the calendar and we say, what is that kind of event that is going to suck the market toward it? Very often you get these events, I kind of call them magnetic events, when the market is just going to gravitate 
toward an event. And if people are saying, I'm going to be a buyer, like I said, with earnings, we also have those in the broader market, things like the Fed meeting next week. That is a big sort of magnetic event. And then we have payrolls after that. So from my perspective, if we are going to get more of like a relief rally, it might come after the payrolls, after the, the Fed um, a week from yesterday, six days from now. So, um, you know, it's important, I think, to, to bear in mind those sort of events. Um, another thing that we have on this, this is the chart I actually use to do the markups on. But um, we so we basically looked at the S&P 500 and we did a Fibonacci retracement of the move from the end of last year to the high of this year. And what was interesting was, was at this level around 42.25 was important for a lot of reasons. First of all, it was something of, it was pretty close to, you know, February was the high just under that. And then we had the debt ceiling back here when we had that. And that was good news. And there was like that kind of relief rally coming off of that. Um, so it had that level just based on history, but it was also a 50% retracement of the year's rally. And now it is, um, you know, under that. So it's just one more thing that suggests that the, that this is not actually the trend that exists. Um, and so for me, what's concerning is the lower weekly highs, the lack of a breakout relative to last year. If we just, let me just quickly just can see. I mean, you know, if you look at this, these are lower weekly highs. Um, and so for me, this is a, a situation now that is a little bit less sort of, um, you know, it, it has the longer term, the intermediate term, have less bullishness than they did even with this first bounce here. The inability to hold this level from last summer to me was a pretty serious um, violation. To me, when we went under that after the Fed, it was a, it was like a problem when we tried to reclaim it and then we couldn't keep it. To me, that was really when things were much more sort of um, damaged from a technical perspective. All right. Do you have any questions? Looks like I am seeing people's comments. If you have any questions, please put them in if you're seeing them on YouTube or wherever else you might see them. So what I actually did was is um, I, you know, I looked at this numbers from Refinitiv and it looks like the S&P earnings are going to be uh, two, two, 219.74. Um, that was the most recent number they came out with. What's interesting is it's actually been inching down. It fell by an entire dollar since the beginning. This is for the overall index. It fell by a dollar since the beginning of the month. So the thing, though, is if you start to kind of put different earnings multiples on it, that's kind of what we do in this rundown. You know, a, a multiple of 18 times would take us under take us under 4,000. Now, this is this year's earnings. But anyway, I wanted to assure that, you know, if we go to 16 times, we'd be at 35.15. Now, of course, these are just, you know, simple math I was doing. But I want to just kind of say that if we look at, you know, multiples, you know, if we believe multiples are too high, if that is something the market wants to obsess over and worry about, then this sort of conversation will become more commonplace. Um, all right, so let me see some of the other things I want to mention very quickly. I mentioned them, uh, about Meta and Google and the advertising, which to me was a, an issue. Also, if we take a look here at UPS, a bad outlook today, getting really hammered. So, um, you know, UPS is one of the biggest transportation stocks. What is interesting is, you know, transportation stocks um, have been doing very poorly recently. Um, we have a DJT here, um, DJT, the transportation index, um, the, you know, Dow theory. It has been, you know, very much showing signs of stress. I think actually, I mean, me personally, I believe that the, the, the transports have lost relevance for a, a few reasons including the fact that airlines are such an important part of them and airlines um, are heavily debted companies. And, you know, with interest rates going up, they are more vulnerable to higher interest rates. And I don't believe that the transports here are giving the signal on the overall market and the economy the way that, you know, historically or traditionally they're supposed to. The idea of, of Dow theory is that weakness in transportation means the economy is going to do badly and there's going to be a recession. Today's GDP number was higher than expected. Um, and a lot of other numbers here, there's no real economic weakness. So from my perspective, the transports here have lost their relevance um, as an indicator. But it is interesting to see something like a name like UPS. Um, because what is interesting, if you dig into some of the data, and I'm going to get to this, but the we have 
a situation now where the inflation situation is getting a lot better. Um, and the weakness in UPS actually, I think, is overall bullish because, um, you know, things like transportation services, a lot of these things, these these are the services, the core services that the Fed worries about. Well, if transportation costs and UPS shipping costs are going down, that actually is a good thing for inflation. And I think we're seeing that and we're seeing it in multiple places, including this report I was going to turn to from S&P Global. This is their flash composite index. And the guy in here basically said, this is comment. He said, hopes of a soft landing for the U.S. economy will be encouraged by the situation in October. He said it's among he said that it was very downbeat. But now we're seeing a turn in output. Prices are low. Companies are actually passing on cost savings. So a lot of the numbers here, this whole idea of this inflation, we continue to see improvement in the inflation situation. Today, we had GDP better than expected, but core PCE inflation was 2.4 versus a 2.5 estimate. We continue to see the inflationary situation improve. And I think, um, you know, this is what I mean when you look deeper under the surface. The economic situation is very good with GDP beating estimates and the inflation situation getting better. Um, the thing that's really happening now, I think, is a debate over multiples because of high interest rates and geopolitics. And I do think that this geopolitical thing is going to become more of an issue. China did something just today. I'm oh, Here it is. All right, there's an interesting article here, if you maybe look at on Reuters. China rushes to swap Western tech with domestic options. So, I mean, if we are in a stage of more kind of tit for tat between Washington and Beijing, that has a lot of risk for the tech sector, for semiconductors, for Apple, and I don't know them case by case, but there are companies out there, you know, you have your companies like your Cisco, your applied materials. And these are the companies that make up the kind of, you know, the bread and butter of the of the NASDAQ 100. A lot of these like, you know, the, you go down the tier a little bit um, and, you know, you go down a little bit in size and you find there's a lot of these kind of companies that have, especially the semiconductor side, the device side. Um, these guys, you know, if China starts cracking down and doing stuff, it creates all kinds of uncertainty in the technology space. Tesla is obviously a name that could be at risk. So I think right now, you know, this is not a question of the economy. It's not even a question of interest rates as much as it was. This is going to become more of a question of geopolitics. And then, you know, the question of everything happening in the Middle East, does that have some kind of trickle down effect? If we actually start to see more kind of, you know, um, you know, tensions between, you know, Russia and China. If you look and there's been stuff in the UN with, you know, resolutions, Russia and China on one side, the US on the other. Well, as these things start to happen, this is how, you know, divisions can start to happen. And I just think it's important that I have seen more and more stories like this in the last three weeks. And we talked about it last week. And now we see more today, like this thing here, Chinese retailers seeing the iPhone discount. Then last week, we saw this thing coming out from Jeffrey's Jeffrey's basically saying right here, iPhone loses leadership in China. So here we go. Jeffrey says it one week. Reuters reports it the next. You know, where there's smoke, maybe there's fire. So, um, you know, that this is, I think, what's happening. And I think we have to realize that this is a story of multiple compression. Um, all right. That was last week. Let's get back to this week. So I do mention this thing with this guy from S&P Global. Um, the macro environment, like I said, is is getting potentially very positive here. Um, we continue to see incredible strength in housing. Um, well, I don't want to say incredible strength in housing, but we're seeing housing is just like fighting against this tide of high interest rates. New home sales beat. Today, pending home sales beat. Both of these are for September. You know, in my view here, if we start to see just the glimmers of interest rates coming down, the home builders have, you know, potentially a lot of support under them, a lot of demand that is going to, you know, perk up. And I think this might be an area of the ITB, names like Lennar, DR Horton. These are the kind of stocks right now that I think, you know, with interest, if interest rates do peak, maybe this is, these are the post-Fed, you know, relief rally names. But I wanted to just kind of point that out because I think right here, you know, we just have such a structural shortage of housing and, um, you know, uh, not just a, sh a shortage of housing, but a shortage of people moving. There's people 
for the last 18, 20, probably the last 12 to 18 months who haven't been able to move. So you have a normal friction always in the United States of just people moving. And as that sort of, you know, glacier, you know, thaws, as that freeze goes away, it's going to trigger activity in the housing market. And so I think the home builders here are, are a name that have been just kind of languishing and sitting. You know, let's just take a quick thing. Look at DR Horton. Now, do a little, a little trend lines on this one. Because if we look at DR Horton coming down here, what do we see? We see a falling wedge. This is a bullish reversal pattern. It's squeezing down. It's making lower highs, but we're knocking the follow through to the downside. And I'll be honest, I'm seeing this pattern in a lot of things in the overall market. Um, the, the problem with a falling wedge, though, is, is that, you know, you have to wait for the breakout and it doesn't always work. Nonetheless, um, you know, this is something that some people might be noticing. It works a lot better for a bearish reversal when something has this to the upside, when it's a, a rising wedge. But this is nonetheless... We're seeing this pattern. If you look at most home builders, they're doing something like this. So I think it's interesting just to kind of bear this in mind um, and, and to keep an eye on the home builders because with interest rates and the demand where they are, this could be one of the first areas to benefit. Yeah, home builders were at one point the best performing industry on a year to date basis. That kind of ended back here when rates started rising, you know, in, in late June, early July. However, they still are. Let's take a look over here on our workspace. This is a workspace on the trade station platform. If you guys don't know about it, uh, radar screen. And what I do here is I have a series of ETFs that I use to judge relative strength over different time frames. If we look on a year-to-date basis, we can see that home builders are up 19% versus an 8% gain for the S&P. So the, the semiconductors are up more. At one point, home builders and semiconductors were tied. But, um, you know, this... You know, these guys have pulled back much more than, than the semiconductors. Um, but I wanted to just kind of point this out because, you know, these guys are still outperforming on a year to date basis. If you look in the last like three months, they're absolutely not outperforming. They have been, let's go back to where we were, they're down 19% um, in the last three months, but they are still up on a year to date. You know, the SP is down 9%, and these guys are down 18% in the last three months. But on a year to date, they're still more than double the overall index. So home builders, I think, remain a sort of um, an area that where the, where the underlying fundamentals are, are pretty interesting. Um, all right. We can also see, I was noticing this earlier. Let me take a look here. At growth versus value, IWF is the growth index and IWD is the value. And so, you know, the last few days we've seen value sort of doing better. The value-related parts of the market, if we look here in the last week, let's actually take a look and see who's doing best in the last week. Utilities, Chinese tech stocks, which have, you know, they've been chopping all over the place. Um, I think they had a lot of negativity in them. But utilities, consumer staples, real estate. Those are the best performers in the last week. These are all kind of non-cyclical safe havens. And, you know, in some ways, I think that their strength is actually kind of meaningless because the thing is, is that they got hit. So it's like utility ETF here. These guys got hit so hard based on interest rates that they have a little bit of a snapback. But I, you know, I think you also have to just realize that this is not giving you any clear signal. The main signal it's giving me is that Safe havens are outperforming, and that is a bearish signal. So when you look at the market overall, what's interesting, when the market was outperforming earlier, when the market was doing well earlier in the year, the outperformance came from technology, industrials, consumer discretionaries, risk on sectors. Now, as the market struggles, we're seeing outperformance from the safe havens. That is a bearish internal of the market. Well, it often is. And I've noticed that... Um, consumer staples often outperform before the market crashes. And in this case, they didn't for various reasons. And we were we were on this webinar, um, you know, very bearish on some of these um, consumer staples and stuff, you know, um, in the, you know, August, September period. Now that's kind of run its course. But I did want to, um, you know, just mention that the relative strength now is showing more of a conservative risk off sort of tone.
All right, let me know if you guys have any questions. I'm not seeing any more comments come in, but hopefully, hopefully we are, everything's coming through clearly. Again, I want to thank everyone for bearing with the you know, technical issues and stuff. Now, remember, we have been watching for five and a quarter on the 10-year TNX.X. Five and a quarter was a long-term sort of high going back to like 2006 or something. We got to 5% and we're just kind of chopping there. And, you know, I think when you look at this as well, though, still have higher lows in place. There's nothing here that really seems to suggest um, a clear sort of, um, you know, top. Um, this is something just to kind of watch. But again, I think with the Fed meeting coming up, that could be the actual thing where anyone who wants to be a buyer and look for this to peak because these are yields, anyone, you know, there's a good chance they're going to wait until the Fed meeting. Now, it is interesting. We noticed that Bill Ackman covered a short position against treasuries. That was kind of interesting. But, you know, the thing that's still driving treasuries here is the Fed. It's not even geopolitics. It's not Bill Ackman. Um, it's that expectation of the Fed. Um, so last week, we talked about the negatives in energy. And I'll be honest, like, you know, I'm baffled with the think of this situation right now um, in the Middle East. Um you know, typically in a world of investing, you want to ignore geopolitics, ignore the scary things out there. But, you know, the, the, the at, at this point, I think it's just um, there's too much potential of, you know, something getting worse. There was articles today saying that Israel is going to start, you know, incursions and stuff like that into Gaza. So when all those things happen, from what I, you know, I have no prediction of what's going to happen with the Saudis are going to do. But the market is going to say, wow, you know, the Saudis might do this or that, or it escalates with Iran. And now we're talking about the, the Straits of Hormuz and these things. And then suddenly, you know, questions of risk of oil squeezing and stuff get a lot more, you know, intense. And I think that um, people know that now. So energy had a really strong pullback. We did notice an XLE. We had talked about XLE. The last time we did this webinar, we pointed out that bearish outside candle right there, and we got the follow through. But at this point in time, um, it is interesting to see that. I'm mean, looking at oil again today. I was looking at USO, for example, or look at crude oil. Let's look at crude oil futures. Um, they had this kind of big candle, kind of, you know, a big gush off the lows yesterday. And, um, you know, this, this kind of hammer of just trying to be defended here. So I'm not really sure about this. I want to just point out that the negative things I said about energy have played out, but, you know, I, and I think that we are going to see more supply. I think when you look at history, we're probably going to see a flood of oil in the next three to six months. And my view is that, you know, we're, as long as nothing really terrible happens, we all pray that things, you know, end soon. But, um, you know, from my perspective, there is um, the fundamentals are not good for energy. We are seeing more, more supply come online. And, um, and in my view, it's only going to increase. You know, I think when you look at the purchase of Chevron, buying you know, Chevron and, and Exxon, both the big deals. They bought PXD and Hess. These are the smaller producer stocks. So, you know. These guys previously were using their cash to pay dividends and buy back stock. Now what are they doing? Now they're issuing stock to buy production. So they've actually done a 180 in the last 12, 18 months. Remember when, when Occidental, everyone was talking about Occidental Petroleum, they're paying out all this money. This was a year and a half ago when, when the government was saying, hey, let's shut down the oil and gas industry. Let's have them pay out. The, the, the theory was, let the, let's induce the oil and gas companies to pay, do stock buybacks and pay dividends and not invest in oil and gas wells, not invest in production, and then we'll have green energy take over. Well, the thing is, is that when you see the deals like Hess and Pioneer coming into play, and then you see headlines like this from CNN, ESG investing is dying. And we've been talking this on market trends for multiple weeks now about the kind of crumbling of Larry Fink, even even Larry Fink saying this thing is, 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 is fading. We've been talking about this for weeks now. You look in the last few weeks, what is the worst performing, like in the last month in the market? 
solar energy. The last two weeks, solar energy is the leader to the downside. So in my perspective here, we're more likely to see the shift go away from green energy and back toward tolerating, embracing, accepting you know, fossil fuels, at least for a while, especially the election year next year. I think that Biden is more likely to push in the direction of getting prices down, refilling the SPR. And so from my perspective, it's more of, um, you know, that's more likely where we're going to go. And so my view is, is that when we start to get away from um, the, the, this, this tension in the Middle East, you know, I think we're seeing already there was an article about at the beginning of the month in the energy department, basically saying that oil companies are now ramping up investment in oil and gas fields. And they are, um, um, it, was a, it was an interesting article, basically said they're now borrowing to finance future production. And they hadn't done that for apparently years. They were financing future production from cash flow. Now they're actually borrowing. Um, it was, I think, on October 4th, if you dig around in the energy department website, they said this. So anyway, all these things, in my view, you know, kind of suggest, and we've seen this countless times with the energy industry when, you know, the cure to high prices is high prices, um, you know, the supply comes and then what happens is oil just nosedives. And if you look at the history of oil for especially the last 15 years, let's look here on a monthly chart, crude oil futures on the trade station platform, we're going on like a monthly here. I mean, this is kind of, you know, if you look back here in 15, look at, you know, we saw this when the, you know, the production took off and then basically, um, going into COVID, there was a flood of oil. Um, so I want to just point that out. I mean, in my view, this um, this sell-off in oil, you know, a, a collapse of oil is coming, but for right now, the, the, the tensions are holding it up. Um, but let's just kind of keep that in mind. I think it'll be interesting to kind of watch what happens. Um, I think if we really start to see a breakdown in oil, it could also tell us that the situation in the Middle East is improving because those guys... The oil traders, a lot of them are not American, first of all. So they know what's happening in places over there. They're trading overnight, um, you know, in London and stuff. So oil, I think, will be a really important thing to watch. All right. Now. I'm just looking at the different points I wanted to make. We talk about just kind of the safe haven demand. Let me look at some of the things where we actually dig into um, some of the signals that had kind of popped up. Um, one thing for me was Roblox. I mean, this is one that um, you know could be setting up for some more downside. This was a company that basically um, you know has never really achieved what people hoped it was going to achieve. Um, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, they've just disappointed almost every quarter from what I can tell. You know, really, you know, get, you know, really, if you want to be, if you're a bear, I mean, this is just a perfect gap to see as a signal to the downside. It goes up, toys with it, comes down. You know, this is one I think is, is pretty interesting to see that, um, you know, in the year end, how does a name like this perform? I think this is one that, that could have some downside continuation to year end. We did a trading view idea on Snowflake. Um, it was interesting here. If we look over, if we look in the actual, you know, webinar, we in the in the rundown here, we go to our trading view ideas and we kind of showed some of the some of the ideas, but we looked in particular at Snowflake, which you know tried to get above its 200 day moving average, failed, had the death cross. This company is incredibly high multiple stock. Um, another name, it doesn't look that different than Roblox. And so, again, for people worried about valuations, some of these super high valuations sort of tech stocks, um, you know, could be kind of in play. Now, another name talking about China that looks you know, to me this kind of is, is Starbucks. Um, Starbucks has been trying to grow in China, struggling. It's an iconic American brand. Um, and, you know, again, it's not that different than Apple if you're a Chinese sort of you know, if you're the Chinese public and, you know, the earnings on this one are actually the morning of Apple on, on the 2nd of November. But this name is actually kind of interesting to me. I think, um, you know, everything about this kind of gives a, an indication, not maybe not everything, but I see a lot of indications here of a downturn, the 50 day moving average coming down and kind of just coming off of that moving average. We have our Keltner channels here that it's coming off the top of the Keltner channel. 
Um, if you look here, this level around 96 was kind of a resistance level. 95 was a support. I'm sorry, it was a support level back in early July. And now we're basically stalling at it. So to me, for momentum, Starbucks could have some downside. Um, it was interesting to me to look at JP Morgan, which is more in the opposite direction here. JP Morgan is trying to hold some levels here from the first half of the year. You know, there's a lot of negativity here, obviously, with the, um, you know, this intermediate term sort of downtrend that we've seen in JP Morgan. We're trying to hold kind of 140 here. I think this is one that people might want to be kind of watching. This is kind of, you know, um, a higher quality name um, and a member of the Dow, not a tech stock. This could be one that people kind of, you know, target um, of looking at very something of a, of a, of a look toward kind of value and and that sort of theme. Disney, however, has just a pretty steady, you know, kind of downtrend here. It was coming off the 50-day moving average. Um, Micron was the one that I did a trading view idea today. And it, to me, it looks especially kind of like an opportunity for the bears. It's like actually look at the trading view idea that we actually did here. Because what was interesting to me was this stock had a bearish outside day yesterday. Uh, and we did this and the stock kind of did gap, did break lower after we did the, the article. I think there was something negative that came out on Seagate. But what's interesting is this stock kind of remained kind of, it never really reclaimed a whole lot versus last year. Um, if you look at it, you know, like Apple went to a new high, Microsoft went to highs and this thing didn't get anywhere near, you know, Nvidia went to new high this year. Micro didn't do anything like that, not even close. And now you have this kind of convergent triangle. What was really interesting is you see that the 100 day, the 200, that the 100 day moving average, a 50 day moving average, they're right there. It's just straddling all of those. And that in many ways tells you that it's kind of losing its uptrend. Um, you want to, you know, people looking for a bullish trend, you want to see the stock remaining above the moving average. It's not kind of just sitting on top of them. Um, so to me, this is one now that has this potential of, you know, potentially a, a, a pretty you know, maybe odds of a, of a, of a breakdown here um, kind of coming along. So I, I did want to mention this one. You know, we had done an idea on Procter & Gamble based on a similar chart pattern right back here when it was basically just sitting on its 50-day moving average, not doing anything. It also had kind of a trend line along here somewhere. And we did this idea and then it just kind of broke lower. So to me, there are some similarities here. What's also interesting is it made a lower high versus previously. Now, if you look at Micron, it does the same thing. This is a lower high, right? So you have this high and then a lower high, and then it sits at the 50-day, and you have the rising trend line that it breaks through, and then you just get the whoosh to the downside. So to me, Micron here has that sort of downside potential. Um, Dollar General, these these stores have these stocks have been have gone from darlings to just Dogs, I guess you could say, um, you know, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, the discount retailers really gotten beat up. And um, this one gap lower, it's clawing back up. This is one that, you know, I think we look at this, it might take about four to five days to really kind of stall. It has the eight day exponential coming up from below. It, the short term momentum is very bullish. But, you know, when it fades, you know, this is one that people could say, especially in the year end. We could see, you know, some momentum to the downside. Um, square or block, same sort of um, patterns. Just continuation here. Um, high multiple stock that is honestly in a very crowded space. I mean, a lot of these, look at PayPal this year. I mean, these 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 fintechs have been under massive pressure. Square here. What's interesting, though, is, is that it hasn't made a new low for like, you know, a month. And when something is trending lower, like this is kind of consolidation. If you look, consolidation, move, consolidation, does it get an extension to the downside? Dexcom. Now, these diabetes stocks, DXCM, um, their business has come has really unraveled because of this idea of weight loss drugs replacing diabetes treatment. And, um, you know, they went from being, in many ways, safe, steady businesses, I guess, I don't know much about diabetes, but I'm thinking people who get, you know, you get your dialysis or whatever on a regular basis, or I'm not even sure exactly what it is, but, you know, this was something that was viewed as a steady business that you could count on over time. People paid a premium for a stock like this. And now suddenly weight loss drugs come along and just kind of jeopardize the entire 
project or the entire business model. So these guys are really taking a beating. There's several others, but Dexcom was the one. I did a scan for stocks that were that had rallied off lows that had been trending lower. I was looking for stocks for, I don't know exactly what the scam was, but I did something like, you know, the 50 day below the 100 day or below the 200 day, but had rallied in the previous week. It's a real simple scan. Um, and we'll show you how to do it in a future webinar. But with TradeStation, you can create scans like that. I have other scans. Let's actually look if you guys haven't seen this yet, if you're maybe joining us on YouTube or something for the first time. If you look here, we have a thing called MA Tools on my radar screen here in the Market Trends uh, workspace. Now, remember, this is something that we provide to you guys. Um, if you have a TradeStation platform, you can basically download a zip file and put this into your, um, into your platform and it'll work for you. It has some custom indicators I created. I'm actually going to re repopulate the S&P because since I originally did it, the S&P has changed its members. So I'm going to re-add this. But what's interesting here is you can just see, this is called MA Tools, and you can just see stocks that are trending lower that, you know, it's, it's loading the data now. But, you know, I look at stocks here that were testing um, the falling 21-day moving average. And you can just see right here, for example, these are, I haven't even seen these yet. I'm just looking today. AMP. I think that's a mutual fund company, Ameriprise. See, the, the 21 day is the gold moving average. So what this does, is tells us two things. It tells us, first of all, that the price today is touching the 21 day. And because it's red with the minus sign, it tells us that um, the moving average is falling. So this can give us signals. If it's green, it can be a potentially bullish signal. Like, for example, McKesson. Today, McKesson is holding the rising 21 day exponential. That's a potentially bullish signal. They report earnings next week, you can see. So you're getting a lot of information right off the bat with this. I'm using the S&P 500. You can put in your own list of stocks or whatever. But these are some of the tools I use to kind of come up with some of these signals. I did want to mention here, my mover of the week was Verizon. And, you know, this is the kind of stock that perform well in an environment like this. Um, what's interesting about it is it's completely on its own program. I mean, you could have, who knows, you know, recession, whatever, war. I'm just, you know, I'm not trying to say that with glee. I'm just saying, like, you could have all kinds of things happen in the world that are bad for the market. And a company like Verizon, it's domestic, is not especially cyclical. Um, you know, it's the kind of stock that can do well in a bear market. And um, that seems to be what happened. Their earnings report was kind of good. And they basically said that they are gaining market share. And where is it? They basically have strong subscriber growth. They're regaining market share. Cash flow is doing well. And the CEO says momentum will continue. So it is kind of interesting to see this. This is a safety kind of stock. But I want to point this one out. We try and identify a stock that is moving on some kind of news that that kind of stands out. And this was what I thought was pretty interesting that I wanted to highlight to you guys. Now, tomorrow morning, we are going to have PCE inflation, but the big kahuna is the Fed on next week. Some other earnings mixed in. And then we have, I did not put Apple on this because we're going to have, it's on Thursday afternoon or next week. And I only put in the pre-market ones. But here's a list of some of the major names. Uh, now, you can build a real nice earnings calendar using the TradeStation platform. I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm not sure. I mean, I've shown it to people different times. So I want to kind of get into one or two other things to show some of the stuff I was kind of doing today and what I've been doing in this more bearish market. Um, I don't have a position on right now, but last week I kind of showed the use here of using um, a chart like this. What I basically did was this is SPY and um, I changed the grid to more easily see the session breaks. And then I put in a paint bar to show the beginning of each session. And I put in a show me to show me when the index makes lows, this big, um, this big sort of, um, you know, yellow thing will show me when it makes a low for the day. And then the white cross will show me when it makes a high for the day. So I can see this been going down, making lows and things like that. Um, and so basically this morning, I, I basically bought spy puts right there and I did it. I got a good move down today and it was, it was nice. Um, you know, I closed my position before the webinar, but you know, for me, what I like about a view like this is, you know, you can kind of, you let it come down and then you can kind of see 
all these levels. And I also have line at bid and line at ask. And you can see how price is coming up and playing with these different um, you know, levels and stuff. And at this moment, I, I don't see much of anything. I think we're setting up for a hammer here on the daily chart. Um, I'm not sure that we have a whole lot of, of, of clear signals at this point. The market, if you look at it, is, is, is pretty decently oversold. Um, so there's two more indicators that I put on here. And then I'm going to show you the way I do it with puts. Um, first, let me, actually, let me load up my Option Station Pro. Hopefully you guys can see this well. I'm not sure. I, let me make sure I adjusted the, the actual font size so you can see it. The, the approach that I use is gamma. We, you know, the idea is to look for puts. Now, this is, this is short-term sort of use of puts that I do, um, and it is based on – now, I mean, none of these are specific recommendations, but it's a way to be thinking about using options when you are in – a sort of um, a fast moving sort of market. And it's something I've noticed. These are, um, you know, short term sort of things when people are looking to, 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 to capture, you know, the market when it's in a really kind of bear it up mode. What you'll often find is you'll get these, these moves and these are gifts when you get a move like this. You'll also notice, look, yesterday, same sort of thing, a gap down, then you basically get that rally up and you don't make a high. See, there's no white cross. It never made a high today. It, all it did was make lows. So it goes up and then it starts petering out and then you get price discovery to the downside. And that's kind of what we saw right here. Um, you know, And so these can be gifts if you're ready for them. What I thought was interesting about the, the price action today was you can see that where it peaked was below that low from yesterday. So this little like line that's dancing up and down here, my bid and my ask, you it was under there when it started rolling over. So when people are looking for you know options trades, one thing to consider is if you're looking at something like SPY here, is to look for delta and gamma. And what I've noticed, and at this point, I mean. I'm trying to relook at the strikes because we kind of rallied about two to three handles since, um, you know, since I started the webinar. But if a person looks for a delta around 30, what will happen is say, you know, in this case, it'd be around 412. If the market pushes lower, what will happen is the in the money position will move down. And what will then happen is that delta will increase. So say, for example, you buy you know, 10 contracts with a delta of 30, you will have the equivalent of being short 300 shares of SPY. But you have 10 contracts, which means that if it really knifes lower, you're now short 10 shares or 10, you're short 1,000, right? Because it's, you know, every contract is 100 shares. So the thing is, is that as it moves, if it does, but if it moves in your favor, you get the leverage will increase because these have a very, these have gamma. So every dollar it moves, it's going to gain six or seven deltas. So if it drops five points, which is 50 points in the S&P 500, if it drops $5, then suddenly this is going to gain, you know, 30 to 40, maybe 40 delta. So now you're going to have something like a 70 delta. And that means that as it moves lower, if the bottom falls out of the market, which is if you're bearish, that's what you're hoping for. You're saying, hey, man, this is just like death and despair and the market's going to just go, just we're going to get the bottom fall out. Focusing on those puts that have the gamma up front, you don't have as much leverage. But if you're right, then it just can move in your advantage. And so that's what I was doing. I was buying basically 30 to 35 delta and I wrote the one I did, I wrote it down to an 80 delta and it was nice. And now I don't know exactly what to do next. Again, I, at this point, I don't have any clear, you know, I'm not trying to make any kind of predictions, no recommendations here, but I am saying this is an approach that if you're in that environment, when you feel like the bottom can fall out of the market, you can get a real acceleration to the downside. After all, the S&P cash is under 4,200. Um, at this point in time, that was a level a lot of people were looking at. We're under the 50-day moving average. It's interesting here to see that this level, which was a high for, these are five-minute candles. So this was a high for a period of maybe, you know, 45 minutes. 
um, is trying to give resistance. But in my perspective here, we got to be careful because if we now go to a daily chart, we have a, which is going to be a, a hammer. We're going to see a hammer on the, on the daily. Um, and this is, you know, reversal. So from my perspective here, there's a lot of conditions here that are kind of oversold. And I think we don't want to be, you know, overly expecting too much of anything. Um, it was just that from my perspective, I've noticed you kind of get sometimes if you're positioned for it and I just keep as my own workspace, I have this thing set up. And when I see the market in a spot, when I, when I want to be buried up and I, and I see these moves, they don't happen all the time, but when they do this use of something with this, um, with something like the, um, um, you know, these, the way I have it set up when you have your highs for the day, your lows for the day. You have your, um, you know, your your lines here. That when it automatically draw, draws the lines, all those things together can give you a kind of good um, view of the market. Um, and very often, you get these early gifts, uh, a little present, a little manna from heaven that comes along, and you get it early. And you know, if you're ready for them, you can see it using a chart like this. You know, like I said, we had that yesterday, and we had it again today. So there's one of the, there's two things I want to add. I'm going to add very quickly. There's two other little things I've noticed. I'm going to average, add moving average, a 50 period moving average. Now, this is very short term stuff. So let's not, you know, let's just be focused on what this is. This is for people who are very active and are sitting in the market all day and, you know, want to be trying to do something like this. So I'm going to be basically putting here a 50 period. And then I'm also going to add RSI. I'm going to actually make it a little bit thicker so I can see it better. And let's add RSI. So there's a few things we see here. First of all, when you have these kind of, you know, oversold conditions, I've just noticed that, you know, things hit oversold. Um, and, you know, that that also tells you, you know, walk away. Um, you can see here on these things where you had oversold. But if you're bearish and you're oversold on RSI, it can make sense to kind of wait and, um, you know, say, hey, I'm still bearish. I'm just not going to jump the gun. Um, and then you kind of get this move, you know, that then gives you more comfort. Now, I can now change this to a one minute. And now this is very kind of short term stuff. And this is just to kind of, in my opinion, keep you out of trouble. And this works in a bearish market much more than a bullish market. Is that when the 50 minute moving average changes direction, it can tell you it's time to abandon the short side. And in this case, you can see the 50 minute turned higher. So. I want to just kind of point those things out. You know, our webinar started right here at this moment in time. And I exited my position right around here because of the 50 minute turned higher. So, you know, I entered right here as it died. And then and because at that point it had gone from oversold up to a period where it wasn't overbought. Although on the one minute chart, it was overbought, which is interesting. But then we get down here, it hit oversold. And then the 50 minute turned and it told me, you know what, you've had a good day, ring the register, move on. So I want to just kind of show that because in my view, sometimes you can see some really good patterns on the SPY with this kind of one minute and five minute approach. Again, this is not something that should be, you know, something we use often, but when we're in a market, when things really just feel, you know, crushing and bearish, um, we get those opportunities when we get those, those oversold bounces in that bearish market. And if we're ready and we have something to set up, we can step in and we have our strategy of focusing on the high gamma puts and being ready and also being focused and very disciplined that when you get that point and you make your money to walk away and do it quickly. These are these are kind of short term things. People can do it with futures. You can do it with spy puts as well. And like I said, the key thing about the spy puts is the gamma will increase your leverage as it moves in your direction. And say, for example, like, who knows? Say something terrible happened and, you know, something bad happened in the Middle East or something. Iran does something, an oil tanker blows up and the market drops 100 points. You're going now from being 30 deltas, negative 30 deltas to now being negative 100 deltas, which means now your leverage tripled as the market drops. So that is the kind of way to think about using the bear side. So it's great to talk to people. Uh, I got to jump. Remember, we'll be back on next week. I'm not sure if we're going to do it on YouTube or the Trade Station website, but go to tradestation.com. Check out some of the stuff we do. Um, and, you know, um, I hope we look forward to seeing you guys in the future. We will be doing these more on YouTube in the future, but it'll also be in the Trade Station website. Thank you very much, guys. Hope everyone has a great day.